Tenakoto Kata. I'm Graham Mitchell and I'm a member of the Infrastructure New Zealand Board. I'm here to introduce the infrastructure um, funding and financing uh, session with our panel. Um, I think this is going to be a very important session. Uh, number one in our poll to date has been the infrastructure deficit and how that can be funded and financed. So we'll be expecting quite a lot from this panel and how to solve that critical issue and also trying to find those important revenue streams to support the financing of the infrastructure. Um, facilitating this um, session will be Josh Keynes um, from a sponsor, which is Simpson Grierson. He's a partner in banking and financing at Simpson Grierson. Um, and he's a project and finance and projects lawyer with specialised expertise in infrastructure funding and financing. He acts for companies, local authorities and government agencies on all types of infrastructure related engagements. Josh's recent works include leading the team advising the Crown on the design and implementation of the infrastructure levy model and advising the Crown and major local authorities as shareholders of the local government funding agency on the restructuring of a debt program to facilitate access to council controlled organisations. I now welcome uh, Josh Keynes to facilitate this session. Thank you. Great, thank, thanks Graham. Uh, so in this session, we're going to kick things off with a bit of scene setting first. We're gonna take a look at you know, what's been happening recently on the funding and financing front, uh, particularly across our regulatory settings and tools and market developments. And then we're gonna move into a pretty wide ranging panel discussion where we'll look at uh, the state of play under our funding models, including the new IFF uh, infrastructure levy model We'll look at how we might re-energize the PPP market, and we're gonna look at the swathe of new central government infrastructure related capital funds uh, in recent years, as well as the funding and financing toolkit uh, generally and how we might go about getting the most out of that. Uh, there'll be an opportunity to put questions to the panel, uh, so please do submit anything through the session and we'll do our best to cover it. Before we dive into all of that though, I want to introduce you to our panelists who are gonna share their insights today. We have uh, Natalie McClue. Natalie is a partner in the infrastructure and capital team uh, at PwC and offers a range of advice and transactional ex expertise with a focus on infrastructure, government and complex situations. And she has over 15 years worth of corporate finance, banking and advisory experience covering both government and private sector clients. Uh, and she has a very deep understanding of the challenges faced in the infrastructure sector, um, particularly on Pathfinder transactions. We have uh, Christoph Voyage. Christoph is an investment director at uh, HRL Morrison & Co, the NZ founded uh, global infrastructure investment company. And he's worked in banking investments and development finance in the US, the UK, uh, the Middle East and India. And he's now based in Auckland working on social infrastructure uh, and PPP transactions. We also have Sean Wynn. Sean is the deputy chief executive officer of Crown Infrastructure Partners and he has responsibility for the company's infrastructure funding and financing activities, including under the IFF Act. And prior to this, Sean was the CEO of INL, where he was responsible for selling the company's publishing interests to Fairfax Media and for the company's merger with Sky Television. And uh, last but not least, we have Wei Lu. Wei leads the investment banking and asset management team uh, in China Construction Bank NZ. Uh, he brings over 14 years of banking experience in both New Zealand and China uh, across corporate banking, investment banking uh, and markets. And prior to his current role, uh, Wei was a director in corporate and institutional banking in CCBNZ, uh, with one of his key focuses being the infrastructure sector and infrastructure uh, projects. And he's been involved in NZ PPP projects, project finance, uh, as well as corporates in the infrastructure sector. Okay, so... I think the funding pressures that uh, New Zealand is dealing with will be well known to everyone, uh, particularly in this audience. Uh, we're at a time where a series of different pressures uh, on our infrastructure are converging, uh, which is obviously placing pressure on our ability to fund and finance all the critical projects that we need to get underway in a timely uh, and affordable fashion. And of course, that's not new. Um, and you know, New Zealand has been in this cycle before from time to time, but I think the convergence of all these different funding pressures uh, means that the current problems seem pretty acute. Uh, and the current cycle, I think, is also particularly challenging um, as the, the unprecedented need to invest in infrastructure has really coincided with a focus on efficient central and local government uh, spending, uh, which means that there can sometimes be effective political constraints on funding sources, um, no matter how necessary tapping into those funding sources might be to accommodate growth. <clears throat> 
of course, none, none of this is, is new, but the question remains, how do we go about addressing it? How does our funding and financing toolkit respond to the challenge that we have so that we can get you know, viable projects funded and financed and underway? So first, I'd like to take a look at uh, regulatory settings and reform in recent years. Taking a, a step back, there's been a, a, an unprecedented level of regulatory reform in the infrastructure sector generally uh, in recent years, including under the government's urban growth agenda, and specifically at enabling the delivery of critical infrastructure. On the screen, we have a radar that tracks the development uh, from proposals through to enactment uh, of new regulation and legislation that will support the delivery of infrastructure across four critical areas to infrastructure delivery, planning and consenting, contracting, funding and financing, and the establishment of the structures and the institutions that we need to drive investment forward. And it's a pretty busy screen uh, across the last five or so years. There really has been a huge amount going on in this area. And we're really perhaps only just starting to see some of the benefits of this sort of regulatory reform now. But of course, in this session, we're gonna focus on funding and financing. And that quadrant of the radar is perhaps a little bit less busy in terms of new developments than some of the others, uh, with the only sort of really major uh, development in that space being the Infrastructure Funding and Financing Act 2020. That act, as many uh, will know, enables the infrastructure levy model under which an SPV can be established to raise finance to procure infrastructure on the, on the strength of a targeted levy, which will be paid by the beneficiaries of that infrastructure. The predominant purpose of the IFF Act is to create that infrastructure levy. So in that sense, it creates a new funding tool, but the model itself is really uh, a solution to a very specific financing rather than funding problem, uh, being the debt constraints of our high growth local authorities, which have led to a need to have uh, an alternate uh, SPV company uh, take on debt to ensure that uh, projects which are otherwise viable can, can proceed. And we're gonna have a look at how that particular model uh, is tracking shortly in our panel discussion. But aside from debt constrained local authorities, I think the real challenge uh, that we need to address is not, not really a financing one. Uh, there's plenty of domestic and global capital uh, floating around that will surely be attracted to long-term investment or long-term infrastructure projects in New Zealand. The question for me is how we can maximize our funding sources and tools so that we can afford to raise that capital and spread infrastructure costs across communities in an affordable way. So it's about how we can fund projects to allow us to tap into that financing. Uh, now I should say that by highlighting the, I guess the relative quietness of the, uh, the funding and financing uh, segment of that radar, uh, I don't mean to underplay central government's role in the space recently uh, for, for two key reasons. First, um, I think because while the Three Waters structural reform is listed in that structural quadrant, uh, of the radar, uh, you know, ultimately, whatever it looks like, it's going to involve a degree of funding and financing reform as well. That's a key part of it. And we'll no doubt hear more about that uh, later in this conference. Uh, and second, uh, because to help bridge the affordability gap, um, we've seen a, a huge amount of new infrastructure related capital funds established by central government in recent times uh, with a selection, you know, from the last sort of four or five years, uh, adding up to about 27 billion of dedicated funding on top of what you might call ordinary infrastructure investment, uh, particularly in the post-COVID era, of course, central government's really stepped up uh, government spending with a view to tackling both the infrastructure deficit and adding fuel to the economy. And we're going to have a look about have a look at those funds as well with our panel. I think they've certainly helped to ease uh, funding pressures in the short term. Uh, but of course, you know, while they're a key part of the funding solution, one-off contestable funds are perhaps not the long-term solution to our funding and financing challenges by themselves. So with an eye to the longer term horizon, uh, I think we still need to get some more activity going in that regulatory uh, radar and the funding and financing uh, section, uh, particularly on the funding side, which is more reliant on sort of regulatory support and legislation. And there's really been uh, you know, a number of reports. Um, let me just jump back, excuse me. A number of reports in recent times and papers uh, from a range of sources, from Tawahanga, from the Productivity Commission, of course, from Infrastructure NZ itself, uh, which have got a range of fantastic ideas uh, on, you know, how we can reform our funding toolkit. There's really no shortage there, and there'll be more to come, no doubt, from the Future for Local Government review as well. So the challenge for us is really how we uh, 
determine where our investment is best placed, what we need to focus on first. I think you know some of these ideas on the screen there are already in motion, including the overhaul of three waters delivery, uh, greater use of central government competitive grants in particular. But I think there is more that can be looked at um, and we'll have a look at some ideas in our panel discussion. But just to touch on some of them briefly from a, a humble lawyer's perspective um, at the outset. First, I think there would be huge benefit in enabling value capture charges through our rating system which is the idea that those properties that benefit in terms of value increases from new infrastructure should be charged uh, an amount which is assessed by reference to that uh, increase. At the moment, we can't do that because while a rate can be set by reference to capital value, it can't be set by reference to a change or an increase in that value over, over time. But that approach would help to direct infrastructure costs to those that benefit from it financially rather than just those that use it. Uh, and also, as most local authorities, when determining limits on rates and rates increases, make a judgment about per percentage increases that are affordable to their communities, and they take into account generally the uh, perspective of the people who can least afford to pay, which is a you know a good exercise. It does ignore the fact, though, that a segment of the community can afford to pay more and perhaps should uh, be paying more in return for the financial benefit that new infrastructure can deliver to them. Uh, second point I'd like to quickly touch on is development contributions. I think more can be done around the edges of DCs. I'm sure that uh, the, my colleagues in our local government team here at Simpson Grierson would say that development contributions aren't as effective as they need to be in terms of passing the cost of growth onto those that create the need for and benefit from growth. And I think that's partly because the parameters and factors involved in the legislation mean that they're more susceptible to judicial scrutiny and therefore necessarily lead to more conservative positions being taken that perhaps don't result and the true cost of growth or a fair share of those costs being able to be allocated uh, through to developers. And ultimately, whatever tools and models we decide to use going forward, whether it's for social infrastructure, for local infrastructure, or whatever it might be, if we're looking to att attract private capital, we need to be better at using these tools consistently uh, and depoliticizing our approach, which is obviously something that to our hunger will contribute to. And we'll talk about that issue with our panelists shortly. I think while the uh, funding and financing challenges exist across all sectors, a lot of the rhetoric recently really has been on the local authority um, funding and financing challenges and, and the makeup of the funding and financing toolkit for local authorities, of course, because local authorities bear a huge part of the burden of providing for our the, the infrastructure that we need, but have particularly acute issues in terms of uh, the ability to spread costs across communities, so a funding challenge. Uh, and for some in our high growth regions in terms of their capacity to take on debt so so a financing challenge you could say looking at that uh, diagram there that the uh, toolkit is looking pretty healthy uh, in terms of the range of options and tools that are currently available as it is and i think that's a that's a fair observation uh, you know since 1996 uh, at least local authorities have been able to access bank debt supported by security over their rates giving them incredibly strong credit strength uh, and since 2011, they've been able to access the incredibly successful LGFA uh, funding program, which enables them to consolidate their borrowing powers and borrow through LGFA as a, as a conduit for the sector as a whole. They also have the power to grant security over their assets uh, rather than just rates, uh, which makes project finance possible for local authorities, although not often used. Uh, and there's a healthy suite of different statutory and commercial revenue generation tools. But I think back to Graham's initial observation uh, at the outset, the more that we can uh, focus on those uh, sort of revenue generation tools, the more that we can extract from that toolkit on that side, whether that's through adding new models such as IFF, finding ways to ease political pressure on the use of some of the existing tools, uh, perhaps such as volume volumetric charging. I think the easier it will be to find and use the right tool or the right model for the right project. I don't think there's a single uh, silver bullet here. But that brings us on to our, our latest addition to the toolkit, which is where I'd like to start our, our panel discussion. Uh, as, many, um, as many of you will know, the IFF model uh, establishes a, um, a, new, a new model whereby an, S, an SPV or a project vehicle uh, will be set up to fund and finance particular infrastructure. And it will do that by being authorized to collect a long-term infrastructure levy from the beneficiaries of that uh, infrastructure on the strength of which you'll be able to raise private finance to procure it. And on completion, the infrastructure can then invest back into the local authority or the other agency uh, that would ordinarily be responsible for it, whatever, whatever agency that is. 
And so then the SPV simply acts as a financing vehicle to collect the infrastructure levy over time and pay off the finance, perhaps with some form of last resort support from the Crown for unexpected events or uh, cost overruns. From the beneficiary's perspective, a lot of this will happen behind the scenes and they'll just pay the levy to a local authority on behalf of the SPV and we'll see that the local authority or the relevant agency uh, owns and operates the infrastructure as normal. Uh, that act was passed last year, which brings the model, uh, makes the model possible. And I'd like to start perhaps with you, Sean. Uh, I know a lot of work has gone into the model uh, since that legislation came through in the middle of last year. Uh, and I'm just interested to know how, how that's tracking. Um, g'day, Josh. Um, kia ora. Good to be with you and um, with everyone today. It's, um, it's tracking really well, actually. Uh, we, we, over the last year, have built up a pipeline of projects. Uh, COVID got in the way a little bit. Um, the position of some councils changed somewhat. But um, we, we got together a pipeline of projects that we have been developing. Those projects cover both housing and urban development. Um, there's some really great projects in there. And the way we think about our pipeline is we basically have three categories. Um, we have a category of what we call our focus projects. And focus projects are projects that um, we've completed a whole lot of background uh, documentation on. We know they stack up. Um, we know that um, we've got really good buy-in from key stakeholders. We've established um, good governance around them. We've got a working group going. We've, we've got a timeline of milestones. We know when we'll be engaging um, the various steps in the process, and we can see where a financial close is for us so that finance becomes available um, to the proposer, the count, gen, generally councils. So that's our, that's our, our, our first um, bucket, and we currently have three projects in there. Uh, and Mr. Robertson actually this morning gave a really great summary of, of those three. Um, I'll, I'll come back to those. We also have a range of other projects that we're working on to get them to be focus projects. And there's a number of those that we're hoping in the next couple of months to move so that our bucket of focus projects becomes, becomes larger. Um, just moving on to sort of our second category of projects, we have a category of projects that we call our, our midterm projects. And there, there's some really fantastic projects, but we can't today meaningfully advance them because there's one or two matters that need to be overcome. And, and probably a good example of that is they may currently be in the uh, environment court. There may be um, some disagreement between council and developers on rezoning of land. And until we get a bit more clarity as to where that's going to end up, it's a bit difficult for us to really um, fully get a project plan together. But we're hopeful um, that the projects that are in our midterm um, uh, category that we'll be able to meaningfully advance them in about a year's time. We are continuing to work on them now. We're doing a lot of background work on them so that when they are ready to go, um, we'll be really strongly positioned. And then our third category of projects are what we call um, uh, um, our long-term projects. And they are, once again, some very strong projects, but there's some quite fundamental issues we've got to get across. And a good example would be um, there's a housing project that we've been doing some work on, but to actually get access to the land to develop it, there's um, an amount of Maori land that um, is involved. And until you've gone through a process with the, the, the beneficiaries of the iwi, gone through Maori land quarter processes, it's going to be difficult to meaningfully advance a project like that. So that's sort of projects that are more um, out there a couple of years away from here. Um, I thought people might, might be a bit interested in, in sort of how you engage with us and what we do. So under the legislation, there's this concept of a proposer and a proposer is generally uh, a council or um, a, a developer. And they come to us and talk about a project. And what we do is in the first instance, we build up what we call, call a work bucket. So a high level um, document that contains all the key information and we try to very quickly run the economics in it to determine is an IFF model going to be viable here. Um, if it is, we move to our next stage, which we call um, developing a commercial framework. And that's really a document that's about 80, 100 pages long. And if you pick that document up, you'll understand the totality of the transaction. And we try to get all the key stakeholders together to input into that commercial framework. 
And while we don't ask people to contractually sign up to it and say that's exactly the deal they're going to do, what we do ask is that people say that's generally where we're trying to get to. And then once we've completed that, we move to our sort of final stage, which is the real detail, and that's called the development of an investment proposal. And it's that investment proposal that details who the beneficiaries are, what the levy proposal is, um, what the order and council will look like, what the sort of government support around that will be. And that goes into a lot of detail. And the reason for that is that is ultimately the document that's going to get handed to the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development for them to make a recommendation um, on whether this is a project that should um, have an IFF um, regime attached to it. So that's sort of our, our buckets, that's our process. As I mentioned, we've got three focus projects. Um, Minister Robertson um, talked to them this morning. For, for people that weren't um, in his session this morning, I'll just briefly touch on them. Uh, the first of the projects is a housing project in Tariko West. Um, there's a package of early works that involves um, some uh, upgrades to State Highway 29, some major water, water projects, and a spine road and the development. That package of early works, once it's completed, will allow 2,000 initial dwellings to go into Tariko West. Um, and then in much longer term, once State Highway 29 is substantially developed, uh, there's the possibility of another 2,000 dwellings going into Tariko West as well. That's, that's one of the projects. Second one is in Wellington. It's called the Sludge Minimization Facility. Sludge is a, is, is a, is, is a byproduct from the wastewater system. At the moment, it's um, pumped in tunnels under the city to the Wellington landfill where it's um, simply buried. It's, 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 it's a hazardous product. It's, it's, it's a bad carbon product. It's very ungreen. And Wellington City's got a fantastic um, solution, which is a, a, a lysis digestion, digestion um, thermal drying um, facility that will really mean that when the sludge comes out of that, it's in a far more stable form and you've got a variety of things you can do with it. Um, it can be turned into fertilizer. It can be deposited in a landfill. Um, that's, a, that's a really exciting, it's actually a very big carbon neutral green product uh, project. And then our third project is um, also in Tauranga, and it's a series of transport projects that we're bringing a package together of the multi, multimodal uh, transport, public transport, and we're looking to raise a significant amount of money to finance about a dozen of those. So th that's sort of a bit long, Josh, but we, um, we're excited because we've got a good pipeline We've got good projects we're underway with. We've got projects that will sort of um, continue to close after our first three ones. And our vision really is throughout the decade just to be regularly closing projects from now. Thanks, Sean. I mean, I think that sounds like it's tracking um, extremely well. And what's most exciting is is that pipeline that's being developed, which will mean hopefully this this model has, um, has longevity and people can invest in it. Yes. Um, as, as we know in infrastructure though, it's never plain sailing. Um, uh, and so I'm interested to know what you know. What are the biggest challenges you've found so far in using this model, and, and how are you going about resolving those so that you know the model can come to life? Um, you know, Josh, one one of the big challenges is, and, and and I think this challenge is going to um is going to go away as we all become more familiar with um, IFF transactions. But one of the challenges is actually just the newness and the complexity of the process. Um, from the outside, it might appear um, to be somewhat bureaucratic. So for those people that are not familiar, the, the way an IFF project goes through the system is you first of all have a proposer that says, this is the project I would like. They then bring that to Crown Infrastructure, and our role is, is as a facilitator to facilitate to bring that project together and to get all the key stakeholders together. Once we have done that and, and the proposer and us as facilitator have completed a project, we hand it to um, uh, what's called the recommender, which is a part of the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development. They then form an assessment of that project and then they recommend it or otherwise to ministers. And then you also have two other um, uh, entities. You have what's called the monitor that's also part of Ministry of Housing and Urban Development that look to oversee everything that, that is being done. And you also have Treasury that's the owner of what's called a, a government support package. So you've got lots of sort of, um, of entities involved and it could make the process quite 
clunky and elongated. And I guess, Josh, the way we've um, dealt with that is that we've really come to a table with all of the, the, collaborate, the, the collaboration skills that we can to bring all of those parties to the transaction very early on and rather than just leave people so that matters are done, have actually all of those parties involved from the outset. So it means that um, all of those sort of five or six entities are involved in the transaction. They know what's happening. They've got good visibility on it. They can feed into it. But that's that's probably one of the, the that's been one of the challenges is just dealing with so many parties. I guess the second challenge would be that um, you know, often the cost of the infrastructure required is greater than the finance that can be raised. And that's especially so where you've got you know, big expensive infrastructure, but a relatively limited number of uh, beneficiaries, perhaps say uh, uh, where there's a greenfield development, there may be you know, a thousand dwellings going in, but you have um, $150 million worth of infrastructure required. Really hard for IFF to um, carry all of that weight and, 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 and finance the, the whole 150 million, but it can provide a meaningful amount so I guess we consider, you know, how do we deal with that is, well, there are other initiatives, there are other really strong government initiatives that we can also bring to the table to be complementary with IFF. And a good example of that is the recently announced uh, Infrastructure Acceleration Fund, where there's a, thousand, uh, a billion dollars that's available for investment in these type of projects. There's the wider um, Housing Acceleration Fund, that Kayanga Ora is administering in relation to their large scale projects. And of course, as, as you touched on a bit earlier, you know, there's more that can be done um, with developer contributions and the like. So um, that's the second challenge that IFF's not going to um, provide all of the finance in all situations. And then I guess probably the third sort of issue that we deal with is, you know, we would like to be transacting far more quickly with a range of projects. But what we find with a lot of projects in New Zealand is there's still significant work to be done before you can get close to transacting. And that sort of work that relates to the rezoning of land, the consenting, the designations, uh, the land acquisition, you know, a, a lot of that work is still yet to be done. And, 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 I, and I guess as, as we see a solution there as part of our role as a facilitator is to assist to bring some really strong um, entities who you know, have got significant expertise in this space, like Waka Kotahi, like councils, like Kayanga Ora and Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, but to assist in actually bringing them all together and to provide a platform for seeing if we can work through these sort of questions on a much quicker basis. So, so that's sort of three, three challenges that we're dealing with. I think the good, the good news is as we've been working through them, we can see that this, they, they are sort of slowly falling away. And as we get, get a bit more experience on projects, you know, we, we think those um, those challenges are going to disappear. Oh, it certainly sounds like they're ones that can be worked through. And I think, you know, especially on that first issue around getting that process, I think that's incredibly important to making that pipeline come to life. But uh, I guess that's a challenge with any any Pathfinder project to make sure that we have a streamlined approach uh, going forward. Way, I might bring you in here because I'm, I'm interested in, uh, in sort of the financier's perspective. I think, um, you know, the reality is that the model probably will um, lend itself to uh, most of the capital being provided by way of debt rather than equity. I'm not sure that there's a, a huge opportunity for equity return through the, through the model. Um, so, so the financier's perspective is really, really important. What, what do you think is critical to the success of the model? Uh, Josh, and thank you. Um, I think, I think, firstly, I'll, I'll say from the financier point of view that we're quite welcome this IFF. IFF has been legislated, and uh, I think from my memory, probably FF will be one of the first legislation that actually narrowed down the, the gap between the, the traditional nature of the social infrastructure and the, the project finance structure from the private sector. Um, I mean, FF has a enabled enable not only just the income stream from the from from the from the legislation from the levy, but also they actually providing from from the from the government side. Is also providing a off balance sheet item, which is which is critical. That you know, the the although you 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 are borrowing from debt, but uh, actually you can maintain a certain level of over your, your credit rating. And uh, that's I think is pretty good. Um, from the from the project itself, oh sorry, from from the IFF itself, we uh, I think um, I do see uh, some of the challenge area. I think some of the the shown already. 
mentioned, but uh, I think uh, the first one would be um, it's a it's a it's a relatively complex model. Um, Sean already already mentioned in the process of the how 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 this of how one project can be processed. Um, but you know, CIP CIP is acting like a as a as a facilitator. Um, there's a quad of layers between the multiple institutions. Um, from crown public sectors private sectors and the beneficiaries um there there be a, there be a bit operational risk to coordinate especially when there's any obstacles during the life of the project um, we're talking about a, a, a long-term project it's not only just a construction period and then giving the experience what we have in new zealand here that um the construction risk and, and the operational risk it's 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 viable and then it's obviously it's in there it doesn't matter which kind of structure of the funding or financing you are using so this is probably a critical challenging for for everyone using this model that how can we make sure that when this something happens we could have a, a really quick or, or no smooth decision to solve the problem um the other part is that i think pretty challenging and critical is um, from the model, um, the government support pack, uh, the GSP, it's just a quite a critical element, uh, element. As we all know, the, the, the from what I just mentioned, the, from the, the, the risks we have, um, that GSP actually providing a, 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 a buffer solution to, to, to mitigate the risk that all, oh, when we're talking about our budget or other, other, other sudden, sudden cost. But how well this SP, GSP will be um, mobilized, and how well this will be disciplines between the, the actual cost and the budget will be really critical as well. Okay, th thank, thanks, Wei. Um, good to have that perspective on it. Um, I think just to wrap up on IFF, Sean, quickly. Um, you know, this this was really about bringing forward projects that were viable but were otherwise, um, you know, hampered by funding and financing constraints. Do you think do you think the model is going to work? Are we going to see a difference out of it? Yeah, look, I, we, we're really positive about the, the, the model. You know, it, 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 it's a more fair model. It, it spreads costs across um, across those that benefit and it spreads costs over time. So rather than someone having to pay it all at once. Um, but 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 not on its own. I'd go back and say, you know, it, 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 it's a tool that will work at its best when we, we can use other complementary tools and also um, you know, all people that are benefiting um, get to pay their fair share. And, and, and Josh, I'll just pick up a little bit on um, what Wei had to say there. Um, I probably have just a slightly different perspective. You know, our, our view is that, the, um, that IFF transactions are going to be hugely attractive um, to private capital, and, and Mr Robertson really touched on that this morning. You know, the, um, the, as you said, there's probably very little equity that will be involved in these. There certainly wasn't in our Mildale transaction, and we don't expect there's going to be a lot of equity involved in our IFF transactions going forward. But, you know, from, from a debt provider's perspective, if you just look at, you know, what the, 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 the revenue streams that you're getting long term, they're legislated stable revenue streams. You've got very robust legislated security in the land. You've got strong government support um, arrangements around it. You actually have all of the construction risk and the operational risk is completely ring fenced, ring fenced from our finance SPV that's going to be raising uh, the capital. And you have you know virtually near zero bad debt. Um, these IFF levies are you know in essence at very similar to rates. So from a from a debt provider's perspective. You know, we, we think this is going to be hugely attractive and is going to be um, um, uh, in demand and will be a com really, really competitive process when we are uh, engaging with financiers. Okay, th thanks, Sean. I'm going to move now from, from one funding model to another one. We're going to start talking about PPPs a little bit. Um, and uh, you've obviously seen that model put to great use, you know, across a range of social infrastructure projects. Uh, but it's had its uh, fair share of negative pub publicity um, and obviously not flavour of the month. I think we had some comments this morning from Grant Robertson about sort of their um, current government's political views on it. Christoph, uh, wh what do you think the future holds for the PPP model in New Zealand? Yeah, thanks, Josh. And it's uh, great to be on this panel. Uh, I think, first off, uh, we are actually doing PPP projects currently in New Zealand. 
uh, we are expanding a number of schools in our PPP portfolio for the Ministry of Education. And actually, we also see the IFF framework as just another form of a public-private partnership. So the partnership framework, in my view, is alive, although it is simmering a, a bit on the back burner, I'd say. Um, I think the question should be, uh, what can PPPs add to our country's development toolbox? And when is it appropriate to use them? So I think many people still believe PPPs are all about substituting government funding with private sector financing, which is really only a small part of the story. More importantly, PPPs allow governments to utilize the full delivery capacity of the private sector to roll out projects where government alone may only have limited manpower. Um, PPPs also employ a whole of life approach for infrastructure development, which essentially means that they are designed and built in a way that they can be operated efficiently over their entire useful lives. And that's, I think, a key difference to public procurement. And then finally, um, PPPs transfer project risks from the government to the private sector, which means that on balance, they deliver infrastructure more quickly and with less risk of a cost overrun. So I'm not arguing that PPPs should be used to develop most or all of New Zealand's public infrastructure, they are the, the framework is really only suitable for a very specific set of assets, uh, such as schools, roads, hospitals, prisons, uh, renewable energy projects, water infrastructure would lend itself quite well as well, um, potentially even social housing. And that's those are the areas where they deliver very efficiently and have in fact done so in, in many parts of the world. We have seen the model come under some, I guess, uh, scrutiny recently, um, in particular with the, you know, the interim review on the Transmission Gully project. Yeah. Um, from your perspective as an investor, what do you think needs to be done to ensure that the model, um, you know, can continue to contribute as part of our sort of major infrastructure funding and finance framework going forward? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think Transmission Gully went uh, through a period of serious challenges uh, caused by you know, we had the Kaikoura earthquake, we had a massive contraction in the insurance market as a result of that. We had various COVID lockdowns, uh, massive supply chain issues. And those were all events that impacted all infrastructure projects in the country, not just uh, Transmission Gully. I mean, for those of you living in Auckland, look at the key street development here in Auckland. Um, it was supposed to finish six months before the America's Cup. It finished roughly half a year after. Uh, look at the Hamilton Bypass, right, which not only is still not finished, although it should have been, uh, but we, I think we weren't even given a, a target date for completion yet. So, you know, those are problems that, that affect infrastructure uh, all across the country. And also, I think when people criticize PPPs for the problems that Transmission Gully had, uh, they tend to forget that the framework has already delivered five other large scale PPP projects in New Zealand that are all now operational and that, that were delivered on time and on budget for the crown and the taxpayer right and this is all actually well doc documented in the um in the publications from the infrastructure commission right they they, they published uh, one in uh, in january and another one in, in september on that specific topic obviously the framework is not without challenges um for a ppp model to function well uh, New Zealand needs an ecosystem of construction companies and asset managers that are large enough to absorb risk, right? But for those large, I'd say mostly overseas companies to come to the New Zealand market from Australia, from Europe, from Asia, um, the country needs a steady pipeline of PPP projects. So it's worth the effort for them to come all the way here and to invest the money. And I think the government's recent switch on switch off mentality when it comes to PPPs did really not help with that, right? So if they're serious about this kind of sort of partnership framework, uh, they need to earmark a steady pipeline of projects for PPP delivery, as was the case, for example, in the, in the 2010s, right? Otherwise, we will struggle. Yeah, and I, and I think the the infrastructure commission's work to yeah you know, sort of depoliticize depoliticize the um, you know our, our funding and financing framework hopefully will, will help for that. But it's certainly you know I think a very good point that stability is needed in order to um, justify investment in the model. I think one of the other sort of themes um, under discussion recently um, is whether we can use the sort of massive investment in infrastructure projects as an opportunity to also help develop. New Zealand's uh, capital markets um, and PPP projects, you know, seem pretty well aligned to that, given the use of of private debt. Um, 
way. Do you have any thoughts on that? Is that something that we can sort of use two two birds to kill one stone with, or two stones to kill one bird? All right, thank you, Josh. Um, I, I finally think there's a, a really good opportunity in, in here. Um, tra traditionally, when we talk about the large infrastructure projects funding, we tend to think about either equity investment or from the large financial institutions or, or debt investment from like us, like banks. Um, although there are many, many banks uh, providing debt longer than five years domestically or internationally, but there are other other debt instruments that are available in, in the on the market in the market, and we see that across Europe, across America, and across Asia, that, that quite a lot. Um, so the first one should be well, 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 probably lots of people already talk about it as a debt capital market and the bond insurance because it's a it's it, traditionally it's a long term it's a it's a long long term uh, financing facility matching to match to the long term asset. Um, but in here, I want to touch on a little bit on, on the. G, uh, ESG bond or, or green bond, if you like, is that this morning that Minister Grant Robinson has mentioned that, and, and I think lots of people in this sector already think about that from from all different aspects of uh, all the infrastructure projects in New Zealand will be part of the the commitment to the to the, to the emissions. Um, so so start looking at the emission re reduction either from the by the changing the changing the way of a construction or the way how you operate it or by the nature of the as itself, this will will actually be a really perfect match for for a ESG bond and and a green bond. This is probably will be. Uh, I know in New Zealand already have a very active green bond or, or ESG bond market at, at the moment. But this this ter terms of assets actually will have a, a, a really good initiative to add into this market. Um, the other one I could think is is this one's a little bit interesting. Um, so there are lots uh, globally. There are lots of debt, or sorry, there are lots of a uh, um, private or retail fund. They actually are acting like a, a, a debt financier. Um, so those re retail fund, that retail fund investing in the infrastructure projects, acting like a like a debt provider uh, with the fixed income. The debt like likes the fixed income fund has has been very popular in the region like Asia. Um, this kind of fund offer alternative risk profile. To the investor, uh, mostly retail investors, I think this morning there's some discussion talking about uh, the super super energy, super super fund regime that we could take along into the into the er this area as well. Um, we're already seeing seeing the the similar structure found in the housing market in New Zealand here. Um, this is not only an extra capital stream in the inf infrastructure, but also quite an alternative in investment for investors with a, a different risk profile uh, between the, the equity investment and, and the term deposit investment. Um, with, with all the diversified or, or alternative funding solution, um, their relationship is not enemy or, or, or either or. Um, all those funding methods or, or instruments can be part of the uh, uh, large funding structure for a particular project. Um, they can either act as a, a funding matrix or, or as, as the funding solution in a different stage of the project. This will provide the best financial so outcome or the solutions for the, for the, for the long-term infrastructure project itself. Yeah, I think another reason to, um, to reinvest in, in PPPs, I think, um... Uh, yeah, certainly welcome your comments on that one. Natalie, I think um, it'd be good to switch now to, um, you know, the, those central government funds that I talked about earlier. We've certainly seen a lot of the sort of one-off contestable funds for infrastructure um, made available over the last sort of three, four, five years. Um, and certainly that money has been um, very welcome to a lot of, um, you know, local authorities, developers, iwi for their, for their projects and is going a long way to not only um, help address our infrastructure deficit, but also, you know, add some fuel back into the, to the economy. Um, I guess, uh, you know, there are some downsides with those funds. Obviously, they're not um, well aligned to the sort of beneficiary principle that uh, those that uh, cause the need for infrastructure should, should pay for it using taxpayer funds. And, and you know they do lead to uh, applicants having to leap into action whenever a new fund gets announced. Is there a sort of a way that we can um, use those funds better going forward? Yeah, kia ora Josh, and thank you for having me on the panel. 
Um, look, I, I agree with your comments. These funds have served a really important purpose. And as Sean said, they've been a really great complementary tool to IFF. So they are an enabler and we shouldn't lose sight of that. Um, in the long term, though, they're really just a Band-Aid and they help us buy some time while we try to figure out how this great infrastructure deficit that we've got is going to be funded. What we need to do is you know, focus on a strategic long-term infrastructure funding plan. And there's there's so many benefits around that and they're well documented. Um, I think in terms of your question around that better way of doing things, the answer is yes, we need to look at these long-term projects and solutions for the funding of infrastructure. It's a, it's a bit more complicated than simply looking at central government, you know, with your hand out to fund everything. We know the scale of our deficit and we know that's simply not... Um, you know, pr not practical. What this means is that we need, the very first thing we need to do to, to create a better solution is get some guidance on funding sources. So we need to understand from our government, you know, what is the role of government in funding infrastructure? Is it a funder of last resort? Um, what's the guidance around user pays? When and how might this be appropriate? Um, and especially as, as you've talked about earlier in the value capture space, that's um, Currently, you know, there's not a lot of guidance around that and it's difficult to make pro progress in that space. So they're all really critical questions for us to answer now. Um, the main point for me here, Josh, is, is just that to do it better, so to, so to speak, um, we need a really strategic and transparent approach to both the infrastructure funding, uh, infrastructure pipeline, but also how we expect different infrastructure classes or different asset classes to be funded. Yeah, and just coming back to the sort of the funding toolkit. I mean, I've, you, you've mentioned that you know this is the central government funds are a key part of that, but they're they're a sort of a band aid. Are there in the longer term horizon? Are there particular changes that you think we need to make, or things that we need to focus on to get more out of that toolkit going forward? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think so. I think. Um... I think we've got a really good existing toolkit at the moment, so we've got a, a good suite of tools. Part of the challenge around those tools is how and when they should be used. So, um, you know, I've mentioned user pays, value capture. The clear guidance on that is, is really critical and it will enable the public to engage a bit more with infrastructure as well um, and, and sort of engage with a strategic plan. What are they willing to pay for? I think things like IFF, you know, Sean's comment, um, it's got the potential to make such a fantastic difference. So seeing those projects come to life will be really important to see some progress there. Um, no one's mentioned the UDA. I think that's really important for us and, and could be a game changer. So, um, you know, can use things that are currently exist in existence. So targeted rates, you know, you talked about development contributions. It can borrow, but it doesn't impact on council's balance sheet. So I think that's a, a real opportunity for us there as well. Yeah, and, and in terms of our overall sort of approach to how we stack up the funding and financing for projects, no matter what tools we're using, you know, projects are expensive and it's really hard to, to make these things work. So what are your thoughts on on how we go about doing that? What, you know, how, how we sort of what lens we look at this through? Yeah, okay. Um, so I think at the moment, um, we, we tend to look at each piece of infrastructure on its own. So we look at a transport project or we look at a water project and then we assess it on its, you know, its merit in isolation and then we look at it to fund it in isolation. Sean talked earlier, earlier about a coordinated approach and I think that's really important from a governance perspective but also a funding perspective. What it means is that you can look at all of the component parts to the entire infrastructure picture consider the whole funding and beneficiary or user pays picture, and then look at this over time to come up with the different funding streams. And the example I give is, you know, a transport project's never just about the core transport infrastructure. It needs, it needs enabling infrastructure. It needs water. It's incredibly closely, closely tied to things like urban development and housing. Look, it's clearly got flow on benefits and whether they're those economic benefits, you know, prosperity such as jobs or wellbeing indicators, um, there are also benefits to beneficiaries. There's land value uplift um, for those who live in the catchment area. So if you look at it holistically, you can break down what the true costs are, who the true beneficiaries are, make some really proactive investment decisions around where you might spend your money and perhaps recycle capital over time and start to look at your whole funding spectrum a bit differently. Okay, th thanks, Natalie. I might switch now across to some, some of the questions that are coming through. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. Um, 
so we've got one here. Gr great to hear from Minister Robertson and from Sean that the IFF model is being picked up. Do you think it's still a helpful model, even if there aren't acute debt constraints on local authorities? And I guess maybe the the kind of thinking there is, you know, the debt positions of local authorities might change uh, in you know the uh, mid-term horizon with three waters structural reform coming through. What what's the future for IFF? You know, after that, um, Sean or Natalie, you might have some thoughts some thoughts on that. Natalie, do you want to go first? Sure. Okay. Look, I think IFS are really important tool, irrespective of um, whether there are council balance sheet constraints. What what it is too is it's a little bit of a behavioural change. So IFF is around. Um, it's not right down the value capture curve. It's around recapturing or recouping the costs of the infrastructure, as opposed to capturing you know wider benefits that may go above and beyond that cost. But it goes into that behavioural change around user pays and beneficiary pays. So I think I think IFF has a really important role to play, irrespective of the strength or capacity within council's balance sheets. I, I, and I completely agree with that. That's that's exactly right. And all IFF is trying to do is it's saying this is a reasonable portion that you, um, because you're benefiting in this way, and, and that's the work that will be assessed as part of bringing the um, levy order together, is to say these are all the benefits that you are receiving, and therefore a reasonable contribution from you, along with other um, contributions from other from other stakeholders, is fair. Yeah, no, that makes that makes absolute sense. I think the model is, you know, well aligned to a number of key infrastructure funding principles in terms of, you know, using, uh, you know, debt for intergenerational equity, targeting the cost of those that benefit from it, et cetera, et cetera. So for all those reasons, I think it's it's definitely got a future. Another question here: um, Does the high level of uncertainty in a post-COVID world make the typical risk transfer under a PPP no longer viable or affordable? Uh, I might throw that over to you, Christoph, and or Wei thoughts on risk transfer? I wouldn't say so. Um, so if you're looking at, um, uh, I mean, there's a, obviously there's an established framework for risk allocation under PPP uh, projects um, and things like COVID, uh, things like lockdown impacts fall into a category, category that's called force majeure, which basically means that there is a regime whereby the private sector and the government share the pain. And which is exactly what, like, share the pain of the impacts of, of uh, these types of events, which is exactly what happened uh, on the in construction projects, right? That are that are the PPP, the three PPP projects that are that are currently under construction. And I think it was dealt with quite well. It obviously took a little bit of um, sort of, you know, uh, the government side uh, sitting sitting down with the private sector and discussing. Um, uh, you know, discussing how the pain would be shared and how the risk allocation would be kind of reallocated, and it is again, it is a, it is a situation that no one foresaw, right? So that's that's exactly why. So it falls into those grey areas of risk allocation that need to be discussed as and when they they um, actually materialize, which I believe no one no one really expected they would. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I I quite agree with uh, Chris. Um, I think. You no know, PPP is a public-private partnership, so that that risk um, come together with with uh, the risk allocations come together, and and then giving, giving the fact that that the, the private sector involved in the in operational or you know the, the 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 whole the whole project, it might bring some of the efficiency into that and to 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 dealt with that you know, you know sort of a turnover time will maybe maybe quick. I'm not saying that that, that, that from a public sector is not. That Quick, but then private sector have, have different tools to and different, different different resources to deal with that, and I think this is a critical as well to 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 forefront that the the, the challenge. Okay, th thank you both. I think that's all we'll have time for today. But I just want to quickly thank all of our panelists for their uh, their expert insights today, and and I'll pass back over to Graham to wrap things up. Well, thanks for that, Josh, and thanks for the panel and their contributions. There was a number of interesting in insights in there. Uh, no one found the new revenue stream, but maybe that is carbon credits that we can, can securitise in the future to build green infrastructure. Um, so I think that brings us to a close of the session, and thanks for Simpson Gerson for sponsoring this. Um, in about five minutes, um, Claire Edmondson is going to be doing a closing session, so if everybody remembers to click click back out of the um, back to the main program and click on the closing session um, you'll better get a wrap up for today okay thank you